Hello and welcome to. Well, to be honest, to me preparing to be slightly, slightly ranty. Because this is getting prescriptive with the cruisers. The London Naval Treaty of 1930. And as you can see, it comes out on the 2nd of March 2022. So yesterday, you will have had the Norfolk class. And why they stopped. Well, here it goes. Let's start off with looking through the individual articles. And looking at how they affected the cruiser construction. So as we have Article 10, then I'll discuss them in the round at the end. Article 10. Within one month after the date of laying down and the date of completion, respective of each vessel of war, armored and capital ships, aircraft carriers, and the vessels exempt from limitations under Article 8, laid down or completed by or for them after the coming into force of the present treaty, the high contracting parties shall communicate to each of the other high contracting parties the information detailed below. The date of laying of the keel and the following particulars, investigation of vessel, Standard displacement in tons and metric tons, the principal dimensions, namely length of waterline, extreme beam or below waterline, mean shutter draft at standard displacement, and caliber of the largest guns. The date of the completion, together with the foregoing particulars relating to the vessels at that date, the information to be given in the case of the capital ships and the aircraft carriers is governed by the Washington Treaty. And why does that matter? Well, it has covers of an annex, including rules of uh, rules for replacement. As far as this, it, vessels have to be over age in order to be replaced. So, for a service vessel exceeding 3,000 tons, but not exceeding 10,000 tons, i.e. definitely a cruiser, sand displacement, if laid down before the 1st of January 1920, you're allowed to replace them after 16 years. If laid down after the 31st of December 1919, 20 years. So, that means if we consider the county class cruisers, when they're built, according to the 1930 treaty, the RN isn't allowed to start replacing them until 20 years after they're laid down. Well, Berwick was laid down in September 1924. Cumberland, October 1924. Suffolk, 1920, September 1924. Kent, November 1924. Cornwall, October 1924. You didn't have a big gap because London class were all laid down in 1926 and 1927. Same as Norfolk and Devonshire. So in simple terms, you're not able to replace these ships until 1944. The Hawkins class, well, luckily, they're able to be, theoretically, replaced earlier. Now, they're all, of course, laid down 1916, 1970. So they can all be replaced after 16 years. So, pretty much the RN should have been able to replace Hawkins in 1932, if there had been a government willing to put in the money. And they could have replaced Hawkins, Raleigh, Frobisher, and Cavendish, all in 1932. Effingham, laid down in 1917, 1933. So, theoretically, the RN could have kept producing counties, because they could have produced another version. They'd taken a bit of a gap between building the Londons and then building the Northumberland, Norfolk's, so they could have taken a gap. They could have built more counties. They could have built more Yorks if they wanted to, to replace them. But they don't. They're able to replace them, but they don't. 
Not because they don't want to, not because they don't have designs for it, but because the governments aren't willing to put in the money. A very easy thing they could have done, replace the Hawkins class in the early 1930s as a way of building up and preparing for World War II or to try and deter the oncoming conflict, as you should think of it when you're thinking about it and reading history forward. And it wasn't done. Then we get into the London Naval Treaty, Article 16. Now, this is the tonnage limitations. And if cruisers have more than gu uh, guns as more than 16.1 inch calibre, you're allowed 180,000 tons if you're the US of A. If you're the Royal Navy, you're allowed 146,800 tons. Well, that's kind of interesting. And it means you can't have 15, 10,000 ton ships. So that does have a limitation on your factor. But you're allowed to keep the tonnage you already have, and you can accommodate that within those limits. After all, whilst it is British Commonwealth of Nations, which includes the Australians, there is the fact that there are 13 counties, roughly 10,000 tonnes each, but some as low as... Uh, let's say 9,800 tons, so roughly 130,000 tons of counties. And thanks to them being over age, no one's really going to take much notice of the fact that the Hawkins, with their 7.5-inch guns, mm, give you roughly another 50,000 tons of cruisers, which gives you roughly in terms of heavy cruisers, roughly 180,000 tons. Which is what the RN have been building up to. And then the RN also have the, York, uh, the Yorks on top of that. So, you know, there's the uh, figure. 146,800 tons. And there's the reality once you look at the standard displacement of all the ships involved and start doing the maths. It's allowed because they're overage. So there is an advantage to keeping overage ships in service. Now, the vessels which cause a total tonnage in any category to exceed the figures given the foregoing table shall be disposed of gradually during the period ending on the 31st of December 1936. So that's another advantage because you're supposed to be slowly reducing your ships down. And of course, there is another a London, a second London Naval Treaty. And there is, of course, even by 1936, especially but in 1937 when you have the issues you do with Japan leaving the treaty system, you have a lot of complications. You aren't going to start cutting down the numbers. But the fact is, theoretically, under this part of the treaty, the previous slide, the RN could have been replacing the Hawkins class. But because of them signing up to this treaty, and the way they have done, they can't. Now, you might have noticed also that whilst the Royal Navies accept less in terms of its tonnage of Heavy cruisers, they have gone all out for the light cruisers, in that the US Navy is allowed to have a maximum of 143,500 tons, uh, which light cruisers, remember, that are the ones with guns of 6.1 inch or caliber or less, because you'd have to do the 6.1 inch because of the French, because they do like their 155 mil. Well, the US Navy's are allowed 143,500 tons. The Royal Navy's allowed 192,200 tons. So, pretty much, they've had their tonnage 
allocated onto the light cruisers. And remember, this ultimately did give the RN, well, the US Navy was allowed 323,500 tons of cruisers under this system. The RN gets 339,000 tons of cruisers. So the RN theoretically has a 15,500 ton advantage in cruisers, thanks to this arrangement. Not something they're going to really be upset about. Japan? Well... They get 208,850 tons of cruisers, which means that the US has 110,000 ton, well, 115,000 ton advantage over them, roughly, and the RN has 130,000 ton advantage over them. That matters to the Royal Navy. But it also shows that the Royal Navy is focusing in on light cruisers. Why are they focusing in on light cruisers over heavy cruisers? Well, it's down to rate of fire and it's down to the 8-inch as a weapon. The RN are not sure that it gives you enough punch versus the 6-inch or enough range versus the 6-inch to give you victory in any scenario where everyone is limited to the displacements they're limited to under the Washington Naval Treaty. You can't build in the speed and armor and other things you need to build the rounded 8-inch cruiser the RN would have liked on 10,000 tons. You can a 6-inch cruiser. Witness the town class. Part 3. Articles 14 and 15. Article 14. Naval combat vessels in the United States, the British Commonwealth Nation, and Japan, other than cavalry ships, aircraft carriers, and all vessels exempt from limitation under Article 8, shall be limited during the term of the present treaty as provided by part of, part, in this Part 3, and in case of these special vessels as provided in Article 12. For the purpose of this Part 3, the definition of cruiser and destroyer category shall be as follows. Surface vessels of war, other than cavalry ships or aircraft carriers, the standard place in which it exceeds 1,850 tonnes, the figure for a destroyer leader, or with a gun above 5.1 inch, that's 130mm calibre, are cruisers. The cruiser category is divided into two subcategories. Cruisers carrying a gun above 6.1 inch, and cruisers carrying a gun not above 6.1 inch. Destroyers, surface vessels of war of standard displacement which does not exceed 1,850 tonnes, and a gun not above 5.1 inch in calibre, that's 130mm. So they're now nice defined. A transfer not exceeding 10% of the allowed total tonnage of the category of subcategory into which the transfer is to be made shall be permitted between cruisers of subcategory B and destroyers. I.e., you can change your alliance, uh, uh, your allowance of light cruisers into destroyers. Or, theoretically, vice versa. But no one really does it. Notwithstanding the rules for replacement contained in Annex 1 to Part 2, the Frobisher and Effingham may be disposed of during the year of 1936. And again, if we go back to them, we'll remember originally they're supposed to be disposed of in after 16 years. Well, that should have meant they would be allowed to be disposed of in 1932. Or in the case of the Effingham, 1933, but they've said they can't be disposed of during, uh, uh, maybe disposed of during the year of 1936. Apart from the cruisers under construction of 1st April 1930, the total replacement tonnage of cruisers to be completed in the case of British Commonwealth nations prior to 19, the 31st of December 1936 shall not exceed 91,000 tons. That's 92,456 metric tons. Japan may replace the Tama by new construction to be completed during the year 1936. In addition to replacing destroyers becoming over age before the 31st of December 1936, Japan may lay down in each of the years 1935 and 1936 not more than 5,200 tons 
to replace part of the vessels that become overage in 38 and 39. Japan may anticipate replacement during the term of the present treaty by laying down not more than 19,200 tons of submarine tonnage, of which not more than 12,000 tons shall be completed by the 31st of December 1956. This is getting very, very prescriptive compared to the Washington Treaty. And you can see that these things were haggled over. Sectors provide in Article 20, the tonnage laid down in any category subject to limitation in accordance with Article 16 shall not exceed the amount of necessary to reach the maximum allowed tonnage of the category, or to replace vessels that become overage before the 31st of December 1956. They are trying to make war less likely by very much scripting what each other's navies are to be. The idea being that if no one can build a massive, uh, build, do a naval build-up, therefore no one should feel threatened, and hopefully no war will happen. We all know how well that works out. Because, of course, the main deterrence that most people have had was being able to build ships. It was. It was being able to build the ships they might need. <clears throat> and ultimately, this is where the problem comes in for everyone. Royal Navy, Japanese Navy, US Navy. The 1930 London Naval Treaty didn't provide the scope or freedom necessary for nations to adapt and deter conflict through construction. It's one of the basic rules of deterrence you have. People make a lot of fuss about it if you announce you're building more ships. People will make a lot of fuss about it. But it's a very easy way of showing your commitment to something if you increase the numbers of ships being built. Let's say... Brit the British government turned around tomorrow and announced they were doubling the procurement of maritime patrol aircraft. You Those aren't really offensive weapons. They allow for patrol and security in terms, in terms of maritime security, etc. at sea, and they would certainly strengthen Britain in any war, but no one can really get upset with Britain taking security weapons, offensive weapons, arms maybe, but these are defensive. If Britain announced that they were procuring more city class, instead of eight, they were building 12, they would build 12. Well, A, those four are going to come further down the line unless they accelerate construction a bit, they'd be a third, a batch free of the, uh, of the Type 26. Could you really get upset with them? You could claim that that's Britain escalating its naval forces, but is it escalating dramatically? No. Especially if they're anti submarine warfare frigates. Britain announced it's building 10 aircraft carriers, that's a different thing. But that's the problem with the treaties. The Washington Treaties existed was a little bit more free when it came to cruisers and things below capital ships. Capital ships were what it sought to really constrain. And you can understand in a way why everyone's been associated with a top line, uh, obsessed with a top line construction asset from the Dreadnought race and the idea that those could have precipitated World War One or been part of it. It's a nice, easy thing to blame. We were building ships, that's why there was World War I, rather than we mucked up our political calculations and everyone, all the politicians made, uh, the politicians all, on all sides were making mistakes and acting in a bad fashion, and a disorganized and headless chicken fashion, arguably, and that's why we ended up with a war. No, it's far easier to blame warship construction. And when you start to notice things are getting more problematic and the world is getting scarier and nasty people are getting the power in places and 
countries aren't behaving like you thought they would. Because remember, the, the Washington Treaty was put on the idea that the First World War was the war to end all wars. What do you react by? You react by getting more prescriptive of all the ships on the construction. This is why the Royal Navy has all the C-class and B-class and E-class vessels and Hawkins-class vessels in service when World War II begins. Because, honestly, the Royal Navy would have preferred to have churned out our refusers to replace the D-class and Dido's to replace the C-class, so as anti-aircraft cruisers and or equivalents of earlier 1930s equivalents of them. The Royal Navy would have preferred to build new, but they couldn't. They not they, wasn't that they didn't want to? Wasn't that they even? It was that they couldn't under the treaty system which the politicians signed up to, and in many ways the politicians signed up to that treaty system because they didn't want to pay for it. Because they thought what mattered was the headline figure of seventy cruisers, not the what are those cruisers. How many are over age? There are enough shipyards still around in the 1930s in the UK that the RN, if it had started building in 1930, could have replaced every single cruiser in service and still maintained a destroyer construction and still built capital ships. And still build aircraft carriers and everything else. Admittedly, it would have had to build up the construction of, well, the creation of its armor manufacturing, but could have bought it from, po uh, from Czechoslovakia and other places. In the during the time period, it was allowed uh, while it was still building up that supply. There were options. But it doesn't. Neville Chamberlain gets a lot of blame. But a lot of these decisions are taken long before he gets anywhere near power. And that's the real problem. You have to somehow... Building ships and building all these things are a long-term thing. If you cut the police... You won't see anything immediately. But it'll be two to three years down the road, you will start to see problems. More often than not. Sometimes you do get... Especially if you make a big thing about cutting the police, then, then that will probably tend to lead to problems earlier on. But if you cut them, that, it tends to lead to problems two to three down, years down the road. Especially if you don't manage to invest in other ways of keeping people busy. If you make cuts in the fire service, well, you hope that there will be other ways things will be covered, fire alarms and better materials. All those things you hope will be part of it. But ultimately, when it goes wrong, <laughs> you get the news images you really don't want to see, and you will get the blame as a politician. But it will probably happen within two to three years. Same as with healthcare and with prisons. They're all on far quicker cycles. Cycles that take place within an election cycle. Defence tends to be slower. Defence is something which takes place over decades. It can be 20 years of cuts 
not two years of cuts. 20 years of foreign policy signaling that you're not interested. 20 years of issue. In simple terms, if you're a politician and you cut the fence spending, well, the odds are it won't be you. It might not even be your party which deals with the consequences of it. be someone else's fault. Someone else's problem. Because the trouble is, defence is not a quick fix. Two years, three years to build a ship. Crew it, put it to sea. Hawkins class are laid down in 1916. The first of them is commissioned in 1919. World War One is going on. That is the pressure that they are feeling, and it still takes from June 1916 to July 1919. Cavendish, she's laid down in May 1916. She's actually laid down before Hawkins. And she is commissioned in October 1918. But she's the quickest one. The rest take longer. In fact, Effingham, laid down in 1917, is not commissioned till July Defense takes time. You can't, there isn't a factory, there's a factories churning out fire trucks, there's factories churning out cars which can be converted into police cars. There's no factories churning out warships, despite lots of billing of building a frigate factory. If you import fire trucks from abroad, no one tends to notice or make a fuss about it. If you buy your warships abroad in the UK, you're going to be in trouble. Submarines these days take even longer. We have two aircraft carriers. In other videos, I've talked about the reality of the numbers. Well, here's another reality. One is equivalent to none, as I've often pointed out. Two is better than one, but you're only one damaged ship away from having one. Three? You can afford to take risk a little risk. Four? You can take on some risk. Five? You can actually take on risks if you need to. And war is about risk. And the idea that British politicians won't sign ships up for risk is a misreading of British politics. But the trouble is to build a carrier takes even longer. To buy the aircraft you need for the carrier, train up the crews, takes even longer than a frigate. This treaty is wonderful. It allows everyone to slow the construction and it's all on the altar of preserving peace when actually what it does is it makes war more likely not all arms organizations treaties fall into that category i would argue the washington treaty is whilst i don't think it's really necessary and i think actually it could have led to japan going bankrupt earlier and possibly saved a lot of Chinese lives in the 1930s. It isn't the case. It isn't. But the London Naval Treaties of the 1930s 
the very way they're designed is supposed to make peace more likely by bureaucratizing war. And yet it only really makes peace more likely if you treat it from one perspective. That perspective of someone who was traumatized by World War I and feels people must surely not want to repeat that. They surely want to see want to see that trauma inflicted on the world again. And the trouble is, not everyone's trauma was the same from Model One. Not everyone had the same level of trauma or the same actual trauma. And they didn't have from World War Two either. And not everyone remembers the trauma the same way. If we consider when we're talking to Russia, when I'm talking to Russian students about World War Two, they they still put the Great Patriotic War. And when you start discussing the realities of World War Two with them, they have a very different perception on it than a British or an American would. I would call the Battle Atlantic the key enabling battle of World War Two, the key enabling campaign, because if you don't have the supplies and things going across the Atlantic, going to Britain, going to Russia, etc., for the Arctic convoys and all the other things that they go through, it doesn't work out that way. But it's not the same perception for everyone else. If you were Chinese, your perception of the great campaigns of World War II would probably not involve the Battle of Atlantic. Because for you, it's fighting the Japanese. The war in Europe is a long way away and doesn't really affect you. Other than on a geostrategic level, which you mostly don't consider in local here when you're teaching history. The problem with the London Naval Treaties is they are based on a belief that everyone has the same perceptions and the same views of war. And therefore, everyone is equally desiring to avoid conflict. But if you wanted to dissolve, avoid conflict in the 1930s, you have to look ready to fight. And by putting off the fighting, putting off all these things in terms of procurement, you don't look ready to fight. You look weak. And that's their problem. That's the problem in the 1930s. The government's cutting and wanting to cut, wanting to focus their money elsewhere, look weak. And the money they save buying the ships they do and not replacing the ships they don't and they they can avoid it makes them look weaker. Because ultimately, deterrence is as much about image as it is reality. You and I might know that a Frobisher is a perfectly fine vessel for dealing with service raiders and therefore escorting and providing numbers of assets. That's the choice with the Hawkins and the Frobisher and all the other ships. They're perfectly fine for dealing with surface raiders. As in the non, not the Panzer chief or anything like that, but dealing with surface raiders as in converted merchant ships. But the reality is, they're not fine for fighting equivalent ships. And when you've got the Japanese churning out heavy cruisers with the number of 8 inch guns they have, and you've got the Americans doing the same. It looks like Britain isn't wanting war, not only isn't wanting war, that it doesn't take the prospect of war seriously. And if it doesn't take the prospect of war seriously, how can it be prepared to fight a war? Which means it obviously doesn't want to fight a war, which means it won't fight if it's attacked. That's the logic, Shane. And that starts off with the 1930 London Naval Treaty. And it's prescriptiveness on cruisers. And that's why sometimes 
not just the road to hell is paved with good intentions. But the road to war is paved with platitude it is paved with platitudes of peace. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it and hope you found it interesting.